Welcome to the Kingsway Christian Fellowship Sermon Podcast. We are streaming live from Karam Downs in Melbourne, Australia. Kingsway Christian Fellowship is a non-denominational, Bible-believing, and preaching church. We believe the Bible is the inherent Word of God and preach it verse by verse. You can follow us at www.kingswaycf.com and follow our video sermons. Now, join us as we listen to the latest sermon preached by Pastor John Shipman. Praise the Lord, it is decision time. Uh, and, and, uh, for, and if you haven't made a decision in your life, you need to make a decision for Christ. It's not boring, it's not dry, it's the best thing you can do in your life is to make a decision for Him. Because He's already made a decision for you. That's why He came. He came all the way from heaven out of glory to walk among the face of the earth for one reason and that's your salvation. How wonderful is that? He created this whole universe. This is how much He is invested in you. The world likes to use that word, that term. Are you invested in your job? That means are you committed? He was so much committed that He gave His life for you and for me. And how wonderful is that? We want to continue today looking in the book of Acts. And uh, if you look at that word, they preach Christ. It's just because I couldn't find a a fitting topic for what I'm going to preach about today. Is that okay with you? I was going to do it anyway. So, it is just preach Christ. Even if I say nothing and you sit here and you need to take a message from a few words, that already should say a lot to you. Your whole focus in life should be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is it. You know, when we are born, we are born, every person of us, we are born with this void inside of us. You know, you know, David says we are born speaking lies. We were born in iniquity and we've got this gap inside of us. And the only, the only one that can fill that is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. We see how people are trying to fill that with substance, with friendships, with all of other vices. You know that word, vices. And you can't fill that. The only one who can fill and make you whole is Jesus Christ. Do you want to say amen to that? It is only He who can fill you. It's only He who can satisfy you. It's only He who can make you alive. It's only He who can revitalize you in your life. It is only He who can give you eternal life. Is that what you seek after? Eternal life. Wonderful life. So we continue and we've been looking in the book of Acts how this church is growing. This this mystery. Paul is going to call it a mystery at one stage in his letters later on. Because at this point in time he hasn't written his letters yet. He's still called Saul of Tarsus. You remember how he was breathing fire and trying to persecute and catching Christians. Those who follow Jesus Christ, get rid of them. The world still wants to do that today. The world don't like you sitting in this room. Have you noticed? The world is against you. The world wants to destroy you. And you know what? It's not only the world. It is the father of lies. It is Satan who's walking around like a roaring lion. And he sees who he wants and can destroy. I don't, you know, I look at people and I can only see the manifestation of doing, the sons of disobedience, of doing what the father of life tells them to do. But we are not children of disobedience, are we? We are the children of God. And then we need to follow what he do. Well, Paul wasn't like that. He was Saul. And he was persecuting the church. And last week, just last week, we saw how that he met Jesus on the road of Damascus. My question to you is, have you had a Damascus experience? Have you had a Damascus experience in your life? Can you point to one place in your life where you had a, what they call a God experience? And I'm not talking about foofy stuff or fluffy stuff. I'm talking about the real Jesus. Jesus met you. He came into your life. He he came and when He came into your life, you could easily see how your shortcomings is as a sinful man against a holy God. If you haven't, I pray that God bring you to that point quickly. It happened for this man. He, he testified to King Agrippa. He says, 
there was a light brighter than the sun. And it wasn't a nuclear light. It was God's light. Brighter than the sun. Have that sun shone into your life. Because let me tell you something. Where that light shines, there's no place for shadows. Sin hides in shadows. Sin loves darkness. But the, when the light of Christ shines, you know the Bible calls it himself. In, in the Gospels he says, Jesus Christ came into the world as what? As light. In that light was life. I remember back in South Africa we had a steakhouse. And uh, you know these little creatures that's there at night time. They love warm spots under the fridge. You, who knows what they are? Cockroaches. You know those stuff. You, we don't like them. When we see them we go... Rrr. But there were a lot of cockroaches in And look, all steakhouses and restaurants have got them. Even here in, in Melbourne I find these cockroaches. They're all over. But, but I remember every single time when we get there, because the place is so dark, and you open up the kitchen door as you walk in, they run everywhere. I'm glad I've sold the place because now you wouldn't have gone eating there. But where do they run to? Do they run for the light? No, the light makes them run for the darkness. This is what sin do. Every single thing that you do in your life, that you feel you can't share with your wife, or your husband, or your mom and your dad, or your brothers and your sisters, every single thing that you can't come up here and share, which is something which you feel ashamed of, and which is in contradiction with the Word of God, is called a sin. S-I-N, sin, and it will pull you into darkness. Everybody say that, darkness. But we are children of the light. Yes, hallelujah. So, um, so Paul met us. Saul is on the road of Damascus. This light shines on him. And then he falls to the ground. He says, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said to him, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. You remember that stick that poked you on? And when you kick back, it's a messy, bloody story. There's a lot of people, even in the churches today, who's living messy, bloody stories in their lives. I'm not swearing, brother. It's the word blood, bloody. You get it? It's messy, bloody stories. So this is what's happening with a lot of people. But then, then when he met the Savior, he was struck with blindness. And for three days he didn't eat. You remember that? And the Lord called the man and Ananias to go over there to the straight road. David and I was, uh, you know, smiling about it afterwards. How wonderful the Bible is. The straight road. Why couldn't it be it been the bended road? It had to be the straight road, David. It's wonderful if you live in the Word like that. Now this is where we pick it up. And we follow now. Because God's doing a work in Saul. Who knows that when God comes into your life, you can never stay the same. You can't. I've tried when I was a young man. I've tried. You know, you get saved and then you try to go back to the old ways. It, it becomes tough. Because there's something else that's inside of you that's now saying, eh, 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 eh. But wait a minute, it felt good. Eh, 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 eh. Because it says here in the book, it's not the right thing to do. You see, before Mark, I didn't care. That e -e 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 wasn't there. But now it's there. It's like a referee. He blows the whistle every single time. And it becomes so frustrated. I don't know about you. I'm so exposed now. I'm so vulnerable. But it becomes so frustrated when you try to live that life. You can't live for God and for the world. You can't. You just can't. You become one of the most frustrated people on the face of the earth, on the planet. And, and look, listen, even though you call yourself a Christian and everybody goes, ooh, kumbaya, yeah, he's great. Your family members who see this frustration, they know what I'm talking about. You either live fully for Christ or you don't. You are either the son of God or the son of disobedience. There is no gray areas. And this man is finding it out now. But he had a radical change. And now we find him here in Acts chapter 9 verse 19. So when he had received food, remember he was for three days not eating. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. 
immediately. Everybody say immediately. I love that word in the Bible. Immediately he preached the Christ of the, in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed. What's going on here? And said, is not this who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem? And he has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Are you amazed? Are you surprised by that? Here is the man who tried to kill others, now he becomes the target. Don't be surprised by that. It says that Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately when I read these words, I went, what happened? What happened with Saul? We know, of course, what happened on the road of Damascus. But what changed in him? Or let me ask the question, who changed? Of course we know who changed. Who changed? Saul changed, isn't it? He was at one stage going after these people. I'm going to catch you. I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to rip mums and dads away from their children. I'm going to get the dad out if he's a radical following the way. I'm going to throw him into a... He's at one stage going after them. Everybody feared him in Christian circles. And then all of a sudden, he met Jesus Christ. And now it says Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. I want to tell you what changed in this man's life. His attitude. Yes? The, bi the, the, the dictionary defines attitude as a settled way of thinking or feeling about something. And in a way, we all have got an attitude. Everybody sitting in this place. We've got our precept ideas. Even coming to church, you've got an attitude. Did you know that? Coming here this morning... You woke up, some of you might have said, oh man, I'm not in the mood of church. That is setting your attitude for the day. You get up here and you go, you know, I'm just going to do this. I don't care what they say, this is what I'm going to do. What is it saying? You've got a settled way of thinking. That is what an attitude is. A settled way of thinking. I don't care what they say, I'm going to do this. And we all have done that. I've done that in my time as well. You come in there and nobody can sway your mind. Nobody can change you. I'm set in stone. Today, that's my attitude. I wake up and watch out before me because I have decided that I'm going to be a grumpy old man today. And you better watch out if you're in front of me on the Monash. You better watch out when you come out. You know, this is amazing. When I wake up every morning, I look over at my beautiful wife and I say, Good morning, lovey. That's my attitude. And you know what? She's lovely the whole day. <laughs> but attitude is a big thing in our lives, have you noticed? Now, of course I'm not saying that when the light shone on, on, on Saul, that the Lord just changed his attitude dial. No, that's not what happened. God saved his soul. He's a saved man now. We know that. I'm not trying to say that. But coming with that, listen to me, coming with that is a change of attitude. This is one of the great advantages of getting born again. Your attitude changes in life. Your attitude changes. You see, attitude is so interesting. Your attitude reflects the way you see the world and how you live in it. It is. That is your attitude. We all got glasses, and I'm not talking about these glasses. We all got the attitude glasses. And we put them on every single day of our lives. And it reflects the way you see the world when you see it through your attitude. Then you walk into a place and you go, oh, look at all these people. I don't like them because they don't like me. Look at them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to say hello. I'm just going to walk in there with my sternness, and they better be out of the way. Tomorrow you walk in and the Lord changed your life. All of a sudden you walk into the first people and you just want to give them a kiss and a hug. Who changed? Are they still the same people? 
Of course they are the same people, but who changed? Come on, who changed? Yes, you changed. And now we can see that it would never have happened that Saul would spend days with disciples. It would never have happened. He wanted to kill them. All of a sudden he wants to spend more time with them. How is your attitude towards your church members? I absolutely look forward to every Sunday morning. I look forward to it. You know, because I can spend time with you. Because if you don't like it, guess what? You have to be with me in heaven. And we're going to spend a lot of time there. And if you don't like it now, there's something wrong with your attitude. But I know when you get to heaven, your attitude will be changed. And you're going to hang around with me for a million years. And more. This is how we see the world. It affects every aspect of your life attitude. Your happiness. I can see this. Your attitude, it, it, it influences your happiness. You make yourself. And let me just say, attitude is a decision. It's not something which you wake up and you go, look into the sky, oh, it's a rainy day again. What an awful day. No, no, you make the decision how you're going to feel about that. Let's dial the attitude this morning a little bit, will you? It affects happiness. It affects relationships. Who knows that? Can you just show me? Uh, I'm not going to say it's in your life, but I've seen it, okay? I've seen how attitude can affect relationships, how it affects health your well-being, and even your success. I've seen in many companies I've worked for, somebody comes in and, and, you know, when they come in and sit in the interview, the company they want to work for, it's the best company. Oh man, this is why I want to come and work for you guys, because I've been following you on Facebook, I've been following you in the media, you are the, just a the great group of people. And then when the boss, all of a sudden he becomes your boss, he says, come on board, now you can come and work for us, and then you work there for a couple of months, and you hang around the water cooler, with people with that bad attitude. You know, they're standing there and what are they talking about? They're talking about all the negative things about the business. And you come and stand there and say, oh, I didn't know that. He didn't say that in the interview. Oh, I didn't know that. He didn't say that in the interview. What is changing? Your attitude. Tomorrow you're walking and all of a sudden the boss had a bad attitude. He didn't greet you and you walk past and all of a sudden you go, hmm, they are right. And your workplace changes. What's changing? Your workplace or you? You've changed. The workplace is still that great place, but you've changed. You see, it affects your success, your health, your relationships. And mentally, mentally they say, when you have a positive attitude, you are more alert. And you have less stress and a lower risk of depression and other mental health problems. Now, I'm by far not a psychologist here, and I'm not trying to change this into a lesson on psychology, but I know this, brothers and sisters, in this man's life, I was an angry young man, and when the Lord saved my soul, my attitude changed. Instead of seeing faces that I can punch up, I saw faces that I can kiss them on the cheek. Because the Bible says if somebody does something, if they hit you this time, you need to turn the other cheek. Is that right? So Saul spent some times, some days with the disciples at Damascus. And I love it. What's the Bible saying about attitude? Did you know the Bible talks about it? Romans chapter 12 verse 1 to 2. Paul writes this now. Now his name is Paul. This is the same guy, by the way. Saul changed to Paul. We'll get to that. Saul spent days with them. Before this, Saul wanted to kill them. But now he writes this in Romans. Paul, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beg of you, I beseech you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Oh, that will change your attitude. Because if you all of a sudden realize that you don't belong to yourself, but you belong to God, what happens? You become humble and hum humility comes into your attitude. If you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is what Paul says. That's a changed man. If you are conformed to this world, you will just listen to the world, and that will affect you, and it will affect your attitude. But if you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you start listening to God, that will influence your life, and it will affect your attitude. Now, there's two birds I want to introduce to you today. Who knows the hummingbird? The hummingbird is a beautiful bird, isn't it? The hummingbird, and then we all know the vulture. The vulture. So uh, both these birds, I didn't know this until I read up about it, both these birds fly over the desert. Over the desert. Even the hummingbird, I didn't know that. I thought you can only find vultures in the deserts. But the hummingbird also flies over the desert. Both these birds fly over the desert. But you see, the hummingbird, when he flies over the desert, he's looking for the colorful blossoms in the desert, on the plants. He flies over there and he goes, there is a plant and there is a blossom there. What is he going to find in the blossom? Nectar. He finds his food in that. The vulture flies over the desert and what is he looking for? Rotten meat. He flies over there. He goes, where is that carcass? Have you noticed they don't kill? They come after it's killed. They come after the lions and everything is torn them apart and eat the fresh meat. They wait until the lions goes away and then they come for the rotten meat. That's what they live on. That is, that is what they like. You won't, see, you won't see a vulture around one of these blossoms. You don't see that, do you? No, no. Both these birds fly over. You see the hummingbird. They, they live on what is life. Alive, the new blossom. They live on new life. They will, they will fill themselves with freshness in life. Both birds, but the other one, the other one, you know, the vulture, they live on what was. That wasn't life, the thing, now it's dead. They live on the past. They will fill themselves with the dead things of the past. And I find it so many times in churches, there are hummingbirds in the church and there are vultures in the church. Can all the vultures quickly stand up? No, no, please stay sitting. <laughs> you find both these phones, and, and here is the thing, each bird finds what they are looking for. But we all do, don't we? If you're going to go around and you fill your mind with all of the nonsense that's going on in the world and, and you know all of the worries that's going on, it's like a vulture. And there's enough vultures in the world right now. No, no, you need to come to the life. You need to come to the fresh things in life. Look, I also keep my eye. I told you earlier on today that they are moving all of these, these nuclear submarines over the Arctic, over to the other side of the world. I told you that, but that's not worrying me. I'm not fearful of that. No, 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 I read that. And I'm well aware of that. But first of all, I found this is my blossom. This is where I find my nectar in the Word of God. Who knows that this is alive? If you don't know it's alive, friend, you need to come to the cross. The Bible says the Word of God is living, first of all, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. So both these birds find that there, and we see now that Paul, you know, this man now, first of all, he was a vulture, but, but I love it in the Bible, it's the only place, it's the only place where a vulture can turn into a hummingbird. Look at me today, I'm a humming man, humming man. Are you a hummingbird, or are you a vulture? You just swoop around and see where is that old gossip news. Let me just go to the one person. I'm going to call that person this afternoon and find out from that person what that person, the other person did. And you know what? That is all dead, rotten meat. That's what it is. Get away from that stuff and come into the light. Come to the freshness. Come to the blossom who is called Jesus. You, did you know that they call him the Rose of Sharon? The Rose of Sharon. Who's that? Come on, shout it out. It's Jesus. Who knows that in him is life? When they come to you with this, all this rotten meat and stuff that can break down, tell them, go away. I want to go to the one who gives me life and can build up life. Amen? So now we see that Saul is hanging around. Listen to this now. He's hanging around the hummingbirds. 
the disciples. Whereas he was before with the vultures. Let's kill these people. Let's get them out of the way. In verse 24, but they plot. Remember in the previous verse, we came to the point where it said that as soon as he started preaching Jesus Christ, the Jews plotted to kill him. Now they want to kill him. They are the vultures now. He's hanging around the hummingbirds and the vultures don't like that. In verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul. Somebody told him. And they watched the gates day and night. This is the Jews to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But, everybody say but. They were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Look at this now. His own people wanted to kill him. Who wanted to kill him? The Jews. He was hanging around the hummingbirds. This is why he was preaching the message of the hummingbirds. This is why he was saying that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is why. And now they want to kill him. But then he went into Jerusalem and look at this word there. He tried. He tried to join the disciples. But these two are opposites. He tried to do the but. What happened? They said, no, no, we don't want that guy in our midst. And what is Paul feeling for the first time in his life, maybe? Rejection. Rejection. Now, obviously he didn't say, I feel rejected, but if one group, I mean, just days before that, he was on the number one, you know, the barbecue list or the party invitation list? Saul of Tarsus, number one. Man, we need to get that guy into our party. If Saul comes, he draws a lot of people with him. Everybody loved him from the Pharisees. They loved him. Gamaliel. Remember Gamaliel? You know, Saul. Yeah, yeah, Saul, you can come to my party, man. I like you. I love you, man. Everybody liked him in that area. There were people who disliked him, which was the Christians, but he had a lot of friends. He had a lot of people hanging around him. But now that the Lord changed his life, all of a sudden, all of those people want to kill him. They don't want him anymore. Now he goes over to the new site, and these guys say, no, we know he's past. We don't want him. And here comes rejection. Have you been there? Have you been there where people don't want you in their circles? They talk behind your back. They want to kill you with their mouths, obviously. Hello, we're living in the 21st century. They gossip about you. Who knows that gossip is killing somebody? The Bible says, watch out, because it's like, it's like knives. If you gossip about somebody, it's like you're putting knives in his back. That's where that phrase comes from. But now he sits between these two places where the one group don't want him, the other group don't want him, and here he is in the middle in a place of rejection, of loneliness. It's not a nice place to be. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there. I want to quickly tell you the story about a man called Campbell Morgan. He was a preacher, he was a doctor. They called him the man of the word in the 18th century. Do you know him, some of you? Campbell Morgan. But you know, he had to, he had to when he became a minister back in those days, he had to go to the church council and appear in front of the church council. It sort of reminded uh, what Leonie and I had to do in South Africa because we were in a Pentecostal church. And when the Lord called us into ministry... Um, we had to do, obviously I had to do what you call Bible school. I did the Bible school, hermeneutics, how to interpret the Bible. We did false religions like Jehovah Witnesses. I've studied them in and out. Mormonism, I've studied them in, in and out. We, we did a few of those. And then obviously the Bible, you had to read through the Bible. But we, I remember we came in front of the council. There were 17 pastors. And Leonie and myself had to come in front of them and stand in front of them suited up. In the days I still, was still wearing a tie, you know, you have to impress people, and you go in there. Let me see if I can button this up. I'll put it in my stomach. You had to stand in front of them, and the only would have to be really polished, looking beautiful, because we're going into money, and there's these 17 senior pastors, and you stand in front of them, and anyone can throw a question at you. That's intimidating. As a young Christian, that's what we did. So we went up in front of them and you stand in front of them and they ask you, you know, about your, how you were born again, what happened, um, about your baptism. They ask you about who's your most favorite person, 
You know, who's your hero? You know, some people went in there and said, oh, yeah, it's that rugby player. Oh, yeah, yeah, now we see where you're going from. Who in the Bible is your most favorite person and why? And then, and then, I remember this still, they, they will then open up the Bible and they will point to a verse and give you the verse and you need to preach a five-minute sermon right there. From a verse, they'll go, okay, brother, can you just, and they will read to you the, the, the verse. You haven't got a Bible in front of you and you have to take that passage and preach. Can you do that today? Peter said, this is what they said. Peter said, you will always have to be ready to give an account. These men were holding you to that. Well, here comes in. Isaac Johannes Shipman. That's my birth names, okay? Isaac. Let me say it in Afrikaans. Isaac Johannes Shipman. Where's the South Africans here? It's only Veda. So I've got two Afrikaans names and an English last name. Living in South Africa. I speak Afrikaans, Mark. Afrikaans. English is my second language. I can't hold a conversation in English for two minutes for the life of me. I can't. It's a second language. So we're standing there in front of them. And there's one pastor, Cornelius is his last name. It was his turn. And he opens up, get, get this now, in an English Bible. Because my last name is obviously Shipman. This is an Englishman, man. And he reads to me an English verse expected me to preach well brothers and sisters I preached in English <laughs> in my two minutes English but uh, the only thing that I remember out of the verse was the blood was mentioned and I went ah oh, that's easy I'll go for the blood stay with the blood preach the blood never did I know listen to me the Lord is good I was a South African speaking boy in a South African church learning the Bible in Afrikaans and it's not easy for me, if I wanted to speak English, I had to listen what you say, form my thoughts in Afrikaans, translate them into English in my mind, and then speak back to you. That's what I had to do. And that's how I preached that day. But that day, I didn't know that years later, this Afrikaans-speaking boy will stand in Australia and New Zealand and preach in English. And I'm not translating anymore. But it's not about me. Let's go back to Campbell. Because he had to, when I read his account, I went, oh Lord, that happened to us. Campbell Morgan, same thing happened with him. He had to come in front of the council. And he said in his book, he said, it is very imposing on him. He had to go and stand there in a big, it was a big church hall. And there were only a few people in the hall. Oh, is it off? Okay, I've, I've moved a little bit over the place hopefully it comes back ok let's just go from this slide praise the Lord thank you Mark so, uh, so, so he said there's only a few people don't worry about this there's only a few people around only a few people he said and he went in there and they, they, they check him they, they check his preaching and then he preached, and then a week later, they sent to him, and they said to him, no, he was not successful. He was not successful. And back in the day, there were no phones, and he sent a telegram to his dad. He sent this message to his dad, that's all. What was in the, in the message? Rejected. Rejected. This man. And you know what? The same time when he was saying that to his dad, he didn't have words to say to his dad. He felt he couldn't face his dad. That's how he felt. He felt rejected by these people who said, no, you are not good enough to go in as a minister of the word. That's all he wanted to do. In his journal, he wrote these words, very dark, everything seems. Still, he knows the best. This man is in a place close to God's heart. He's rejected. But he still looks on to the Father and he says, doesn't matter what happened. The people can reject me, but I'm not rejected by you. It wasn't long. I think it was a week later. His father telegrammed back to him. Rejected on earth. Accepted in heaven. Dad. I would have loved to get a letter like that. Would you? Doesn't have to say a whole thing. Rejected on earth, my son. But you're an accepted in heaven. And this means a lot to me. Dad. It's coming from your dad. He then later wrote in, in his journal, he says, God said to me, 
in the weeks of loneliness and darkness that followed, I want you to cease making plans for yourself and let me plan your life. He went on to become one of the great preachers in Britain. And, and that's what I say. They call him the man of the word. He preached the word of God. And many were touched by his preaching. He could have turned around that first day and said, I walk away from this. His dad could have said, who do those people think? You see, here comes the attitude. Who do those people think they are to say that about my son? Let me get on a train and give them a piece of my mind. But what did his dad know? He said, my son, you need encouragement. And he sent him some encouragement. You know that there's still people today who reject Paul? He was rejected by his own. They wanted to kill him. The new Christians didn't want to hang out with him. But, you know, one would think now that we're in this church in the 21st century that everybody will accept Paul. But no, there's so many people still today who reject Paul. They are not for him. I've heard it. There are people who read the letters. They read the Gospels and they go, hmm... Yeah, I know that Paul said this, but I don't think you should, uh, you should take this with a salt, a little grain of salt. Paul said this about this. No, no, I, don't, I disagree with Paul here. Can I remind you what the Bible says? You're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is that including Paul's letters? Absolutely. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, every single word in the Bible, I believe, is God's words. Every single letter that's written in this Bible is from God. And I take it as the Holy Scriptures. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I was walking in New Zealand once and a lady came to me. And she, she opened up in, in Galatians and she said, I disagree totally with Paul here. And you know what I said to her? I said to her, look, wh why are you mentioning it to me? Are you trying to pick up a fight with me, the pastor, about what's written there? I said, I suggest you go home, get scissors and cut it out of your Bible. If that's going to please you. If that's going to please you, go and take it out. And I said, but that's a dangerous thing if you're going to do that. Because before soon, everything will be cut out. It's a slippery slope if you go down that road. Let's see what Peter says. Peter, the apostle, about Paul. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. He says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to the things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also, listen, our beloved brother Paul. See this? Who's writing this? Peter is writing it about Paul. So if you sit here today, or if you've heard sermons about pastors, even pastors, saying, Oh, no, I don't think Paul is right here. Or I don't think Paul's letters is all needed to be in the Bible. Don't talk to Peter. He says, our beloved brother Paul was writing about salvation. He says, the long-suffering is salvation. As also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Where is wisdom coming from? From God. He says, he's giving it to you. As also, in all his epistles, where is his epistles? It's in your Bible. In all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Of what things? Of salvation. Of these things. Of salvation. All of Paul's letters is about salvation. All of Paul's letters is about salvation, doctrine, and how you need to apply that salvation to your life. All of his letters. These things. In which are some things hard to understand. Listen to me now. It's hard to understand which untaught. Everybody say untaught. And unstable. Everybody say unstable. People twist, everybody say twist, to their own destruction. This is the problem today. His own people wanted to kill him. The new people didn't want to hang around him because he was Saul. They knew his history. But even today, there are some circles 
if, let me warn you, let me warn you right here. If somebody turns to you and say, look, you need to not, if, if Saul writes about, you know, eating, this is one of the things he writes about, and Sabbaths, you know, the Seventh day Adventists, oh, no, no, you know, you can't believe what Saul said. You need to go to the Old Testament. That is more true than what Paul said. Have you heard that? I have. If they say that, you go to them and you say, you are untaught. They're not going to like it. You need to say to them, you are unstable. They're not going to like it, are they? <laughs> They're going to reject you. But what is Peter saying? And before they get cross at you, just stop them. Say, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't be mad at me. I'm only the messenger. It's Peter who said that. Do you accept Peter's word as God, as, as the Bible? As, as the, yeah? Then you need to also accept Paul's words as every single thing he writes about. And don't. Listen to me. There's another word, and I'm, I'm continuing on. The word twist. The word twist. I've heard so many people where they say, this is what Paul said, but this is how you need to understand what Paul said. Have you met those people? Oh no, this is not what he meant. And then they tell me all of these fips about how it should be, and I go, yeah, no, I think it's what it meant, because if you turn back here with Scripture, interpret Scripture, this is actually, con con yeah, no, no, I think it means what it means. And you, need, well, you know what you need to tell them? They are untaught and unstable people. But let's continue on. You read him. We remember Campbell. His dad was to him an inspiration. And then we see that Saul also needed an inspiration. And here we find him, brothers and sisters. In Acts chapter 9, verse 27, he says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. We all need an encourager. How wonderful is it when somebody walks into your life and it encourages you? How wonderful is that? Would you agree with me today? And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. And um, that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and out. This is Barnabas, son of encouragement. That's what his name means. We've met him before in, in verse 36. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite. What did he do? He sold everything he had and he brought it to the apostles. This man had a gifting of encouragement. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, we all need them. We all need an encourager. Are you an encourager? Encouragers is people, they are hummingbirds. They build up. They see life. They, they lift you up. They don't tell you lies. They don't tell you lies. They will tell you the truth in love, but that truth... It's encouraging for you to realize the blind spot you've got and it's helping you to become a better person. This is encourages. I, I, had, I mean, I can stand here today and tell you about many of them that I had in ministry. Many. When I was down and out and the Lord, I, the Lord was always there. Always. I'm not saying no. He's always my encourager. But He sent people around us to help us to encourage us. You know, Elijah... I'm the only one. I'm the only one. All of them is gone. And the Lord sent him a message and said, no, there's others out there. And I've been in my times where I sat there and I, I remember I said it to people in, in New Zealand. We had a church on a double story. And there, were, there was one day I walked down stairs and I sat down. Nobody came down at the bottom. And I sat down there and I cried before the Lord. And this is how my prayer went, Lord, I can't. I can't. The Lord met me there that day. The Lord in the Spirit spoke to me. I walk up. I look out. It's raining. And I look through the window. And here comes brother Pete Compton and his wife, 75 years old, with an umbrella, in the rain, in the rain, walking to church. Coming into the church that morning, you know what came out of his mouth? I want to come here today to encourage you. Did he see me down there? We all need them. We all have them encouragers. Here comes Barnabas. Take Saul to the apostles. The disciples is afraid, man. They're running away from this man. But the apostles now, they meet this man of encouragement. So, let's finish this morning, verse 29. 
And now we find this man, and he spoke boldly in the, in the name of the Lord, Jesus, and dispute against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. We've met these people before, haven't we? Remember in Acts chapter 6, verse 1? They were the ones complaining about the widows, not getting their right share. But you need to understand something about the Hellenists. They were the Jews who were mixed with the Greek culture. Those were the Hellenists. And let it be known that if you try to mix Christianity with anything else, it will be a mess. It's always a problem. It always causes issues. This is why even today when I spoke to you, I needed to tell you that I'm not a psychologist. When I spoke about attitude, I talk it out of the biblical perspective. I know for a, for a fact that if the Lord saves your soul, your attitude will change. I know that. And here, we people, they were mixed with Greek culture. They had a poly, polyistic religion. That means they had many gods. Many gods. They worshipped Olympus, Zeus, and Mercury. All of these Olympian gods, they worshipped them. And they mixed it in. And they also had an animistic. Have you seen this one? Animistic. It is in churches right now. Some churches are doing animistic worship. They call it, they call it the new vibrant churches. The new vibrant churches. Be careful. It is animistic. It comes from a Greek culture. What is animistic worship? We are all in tune with nature. Have you find these churches now where they had to have a labyrinth in the church? Where they have to burn a candle. Where did the candle burning come from funerals? Where did it come from? It's all part of this animistic worship. No man, worship is between you and God. It's, you don't need anything else to worship God than you. <coughs> but these people, we are all part of, you know, I'm part of that tree outside. I'm just different molecules. Somebody goes to change on, they cut off the tree and, and, and those leaves, they scream out and I go, oh, I can feel the pain of the tree. That's so sore. You walk past and you pick one of the leaves of the tree and the, the leaf tell the other tree and that tree tells that tree and they tell the ocean and the ocean goes into the sky and it rains over you now, hailstorms to punish you. Can you believe this stuff? There's an ant. Oh, ow, that was sore. Stepping on an ant. We're all part of it. Don't step on the ant. Do you know people like that? You're not allowed to even kill an aunt. Did I say that right? Not your auntie. The aunt. Okay. Please don't kill your auntie. <laughs> Animistic worship. It's happening all around us and we don't even know it. There are Christians in churches doing it and they don't even know it. Oh, the vibe's there. You know the vibe. Let's go with the vibe. We all, let's go and hug a tree. I'm not a tree hugger. God made trees. And you know what? I have dominion over it. If it's in my way and I need to cut it off, I'll cut it off. Oh, I'm in trouble now with that. <laughs> I know. I know. There might be rules and regulations, so but let's not go into that. So, um, so this is the Hellenists. Now, against that, what is Saul preaching? He's preaching Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus is the Christ. Let it be known. Our church is one of these churches. We preach, have you heard it? I preach Christ here. Now, the animatic churches, worship, don't like us. And they will speak out against us. And instead of me going sitting on a stone and going, oh, I'm feeling rejected, I thank the Lord that I don't have to. Amen? And you don't have to. We are a monistic worship. We praise one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You know in the Bible, some Bibles, I'll finish with this. I know I'm going a little bit on, but let, let me just show. When you go to the Jehovah Witnesses Bible and you open up in, one John, uh, in John chapter 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was a God. Yeah? Small. It's only you go, what is it? What's wrong with that? I've heard people say that to me, Christians. What's wrong with them just putting an A there? It's a nice A. A God. Well, that is, that is what you call these poly... You know, he's only a extra God. No, no, Jesus is the God. In our Bible, Bibles, it's not there. I uh, just thought I'd throw that in. Let's finish. This is the last verse, I promise. Now, when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea 
So what happens before I get to that? They wanted to kill him. You see these Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. And now again they find out and they brought him down to Caesarea, sent him out to Tarsus, back to his hometown. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So brothers and sisters, what we have here? You see, when I said before, I, I gave it a topic, preach Christ. Do you think that's the right topic? Has somebody got a better topic? I hope there was a better topic, but now, now I'll have to put it online as preach Christ. <laughs> but it's so much more, it's about attitude. What attitude have you got this morning? What attitude have you got? What is the lens that you look at the world through today? Just do a little bit of a quick introspection. You know, you just look into your own heart. Don't look left and right. You just look inside. And you say, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me. Is it the people or is it me? If it is me, Help me. That's all you need to say. Because I'm telling you one thing. If your attitude is wrong, you're going to get problems. You're going to get trouble. If your attitude towards God is wrong, I pray for you. Because you're going to lose. And the wrong attitude in the world is not going to help you either. But here is the great news. I've got encouragement for you. Amen. Why don't you just stand with me? Everybody stand. And uh, if you're sitting here today and you're just feeling, you say, Lord, you know, I, I, I've got an attitude. I do, I'm not going to do an altar call. Don't worry. Don't let the devil come and start stealing from you right now what, what the Lord wants to do. You're standing there. I want you to cry out in your heart to the Lord. You say, Lord, I know my family knows my attitude. When I get cranky, I get really cranky, Lord. I need to look inside. Why don't you just cry out there where you stand. Just cry out in your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, help me, Lord. Oh, I don't want to be that person. Lord, sometimes I feel so ashamed when it happens. When my attitude's wrong. Father, help me. Help me, Lord, so that every time the, when it happens, the Holy Spirit can guide me. Why don't you just close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Just cry out to the Lord where you are. You don't have to do it out loud. You can just in your heart cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, help me, Father. And, and, and if you stand here today and you say, Lord, I feel rejected, why don't you just cry out to him as well and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your encouragement. It is so wonderful. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to do that, just where you are. Just in your own time, in your mind, speak to the Lord. Even if you want to make an appointment with the Lord, say, Lord, I can't talk now. I'm, I'm, my emotions is welling up. I'm, Lord, I'm feeling all of these emotions coming up. I know the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. I can't do it now, Lord, but this afternoon, there's going to be a time, Lord, when I'm going to sit just for an half an hour and talk it out with you. Let's talk it over in the sweet by and by. That, you know, is that your song this morning? Just, just say, Lord, we're going to sit down for an half an hour and we're going to talk it over. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, as people have reached out to you, know you know each heart here in this place. And Father, if people have cried out for this, I pray that you will, that you will not even on my word, Father, I'm just praying, Lord, that you will meet them there. I know you will, Father, I know you will. But I just pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, we don't want to just do church. We don't just want to come here and have, have teachings, Lord. This is not teachings, Lord. We want to change. Lord, we want to change. If we hear about attitude teaching, Lord, we want to change. We want to do. We want to do what we've heard, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Have we learned something today? Yes.